Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for Traceable AI's webinar series on APIs and API security. Today we'll be covering API testing methodology and we will be starting in about 30 seconds as we let people load in. So please hang tight and we will get started momentarily. Thank you. All right, let's get rolling. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from, thank you for doing so. And welcome to today's webinar, API Testing Methodology. My name is Dan Gordon. I lead the technical evangelism team here at Traceable AI, and I'm happy to be your host today. And here, and then we've got a little bit of background noise going. Um, hopefully we can clear that up. Uh, and we'll get rolling here. Um, please chime in uh, to the chat uh, if, uh, if there are problems uh, to let us know. Thank you. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dan Gordon, we have the technical evangelism team at Traceable and I'm happy to host. Uh, we've got some great knowledge uh, to share with you, but before we do that, I wanna do a couple of housekeeping items. First, today's session is being recorded and will be available to you after the session uh, via Bright Talk. Uh, we welcome questions in the webinar control panel. Uh, underneath it, click on the QA button and enter your questions. We'll do our best to answer those towards the end of the session. If we are not able to get to your questions, we will do our best to answer them offline. And you're also welcome to connect with us and or Katie directly um, to, to ask your questions. We will pass those along. With that, I'm proud to be able to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Katie Paxton Fear. Katie has her doctorate in insider threat investigation using natural language processing. She's a cybersecurity lecturer, a white hat hacker, and a YouTuber teaching about API security and ethical, ethical API hacking, which you can find on her channel, Insider PhD. We're honored to have Dr. Katie Paxton Fear with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Katie. Thank you, Dan. It's a uh... Really great to be here for, I think, what's the third webinar in this series. I really apologize if there's a lot of background noise from me. It is because it is hot here. <laughs> and my laptop is just the fans are whirring. I really apologize if you could hear the laptop fans in the background. Um, but today we're going to be covering API testing methods. So before, so in some of the older ones from um, the last few weeks, we've kind of covered kind of the introduction to API security. We've then started um, to look at how you might do reconnaissance on an API. And really, we're going to be doing the next step. We're going to be talking about you know, what happens after we do that reconnaissance, um, what comes next. And really, the question is, you know, how do you go from having all these API endpoints to actually finding vulnerabilities in the API? Like, It's no good if you just have a complete list of API endpoints and no idea how to secure them. So that's what we're going to be covering today. Um, so let's start off with my methodology. Now, I am what you might call, if you were to put me in those like D&D alignment, um, chaotic. Uh, so the way I tend to follow like my testing methodology is I always say that I'm following my nose. I'm quite often just poking around and seeing what I can find. But what does that really look like? Because that's not really helpful and that's not really something I can teach you or something you can actually even learn from. So if you think about what we did last, last time, we were looking at how to basically collect a list of endpoints. So what comes next? When we've got a list of endpoints, we're really trying to figure out what things do. Like we wanna find out, is that going to change our username? Is that changing our password? Is that changing our email? Is it creating a new post? Is it editing something? Is it changing, changing something in a different way? Is it relinking all of the attributes? We're really trying to understand the functionality in kind of a business level, right? We don't want to be thinking, um, 
oh, this does this specific CRUD operation. We're really thinking high level. And then the next stage is really to start clicking every button. Now, sometimes that can involve fuzzing, but it's really figuring out what you as an individual have access to, where are the boundaries of what you should be able to access. So then you can figure out when you can expand that. So let me talk about this as kind of an example. You can kind of think of API testing as like a series of circles. So in the innermost circle in the core, we have what a user should be able to access. So what they can do, what they should be able to do. Then out just outside of that, you have what they can do, which they shouldn't necessarily be able to do, but the API endpoints exist. Why might we use that? Well, we might not provide a way on the UI for somebody to say, um, change their email address, because we might save that for potentially when we are dealing with, um, you know, administrative functionalities, like you can do it, but it's not necessarily going to happen. It's not something we always want them to be able to do. Um, and we might make them, in fact, more vulnerable. So we then have one step further away is what they um, can access, which they don't necessarily know they can access. Um, even in like hidden menus, like that's when we start talking about fuzzing. That's where we're going to find those vulnerabilities. It's that kind of what do what is the entire bounds of what somebody can do, um, which they shouldn't be able to. And then from that, it's identifying the interesting endpoints because there'll be lots of these. And just because something shouldn't be available doesn't actually mean that there's a security risk there. It may be not fantastic, but it doesn't mean there's a security risk. So that's why we're looking for interesting endpoints, but also because we're looking for the endpoints that might be have a security vulnerability and what might get from it. So step one, figure out what an application feature does. It's that like high level business level business logic overview. And what that kind of looks like practically is I'm going to be sitting there using um, Burp Suite's repeater and I'm going to be labeling things. So I'm going to be saying, OK, that's how I find the avatar. This is how I upload the avatar. This is when I modify a contact. I'll start to label these these tabs to talk about what they do kind of business wise, because seeing 91, 92, 93, 94 is actually not that helpful. But if I start to label, OK, that request uploads an avatar that request finds the avatar for a specific user ID. And realistically, I don't always do this, but I do have a general idea of the functionality and what um, I end up having access to. So step two is clicking every button or doing some fuzzing. So this is the API recon stage. Um, I will fully admit I'm not that very good at recon um, uh, because it's hard to do recon as an outsider when you're actually um, testing your own applications, this is not that much of an issue. Or if you have some kind of internal knowledge, like if you're a security engineer and you have a developer that you can just go ask things to, um, it's not a much of a problem. But for me, being someone completely on the outside, um, I don't know what's there. So I rely on my secret technique, which is hit every button. Every single time I see a piece of functionality, I click it. I look and see, OK, I will go into the um, hamburger menu. I'll go to my profile and I will try and change every field. You know, is that sending a new request or is that actually sending a big, big payload which has like all of the fields in? Now, if testing an API, I might use um, word lists to find additional endpoints. I talked about that a little bit in the last webinar. So if you're interested in API recon, I really recommend re watching that one because I cannot cover everything API Recon because there is so much information um, on that. Um, and sometimes I might do some fuzzing for vulnerabilities. So one thing that APIs can often be very vulnerable to is um, SQL injection. And SQL injection is a really severe vulnerability. So essentially what it gives an attacker access to is everything in the database. Um, and one thing it's really great to do is to use a blind SQL injection to test for um, these types of vulnerabilities. Now, what they do is they don't actually try and get stuff out of the database. They basically see if you can cause the page to load a bit slower. Um, so what they'll do is they'll put like a wait command in. They'll say, OK, can you wait five seconds? And then if we know that it takes five seconds to return, 
then it might be vulnerable to SQL injection. Then I'm going on to the next um, next thing of you know testing for that. One thing to really be careful of when you're testing in general is that you're not doing things destructively. Now, this applies to more than just API testing. This stands for all security testing. Um, and I bring it up because I'm thinking about you know SQL injection. Now, SQL injection can be really dangerous because you can really can delete someone's entire database. So it's really, really important that we don't do things destructively and that we do within the legal um, limits of what we've actually been asked to test. So if that's on a bug bounty program, it means that we're testing the correct scope. If we're doing it as part of penetration testing engagement, it's we're doing the right scope. If we're doing it part of red team, it means that you know we have that reflective period where we talk to the blue team um, and so on. So it's really important to make sure you are doing things within the uh, legal uh, uh, guidelines. So the next thing is identify interesting endpoints. And this is by far one of the most hardest ones to actually quantify because it's like, what is an interesting endpoint? What does that mean? What are you actually looking for? So what I'm looking for is signs of vulnerabilities. So if I'm thinking, if I'm seeing an ID, I'm instantly thinking, okay, I'm testing for an idol. I'm testing for a bowler. If I see reflective input, I'm then testing for something like injection. So great tip for API hacking is that sometimes protections are only implemented on the client side and not on the API. So testing like XSS can actually still be quite a valid way to test uh, APIs because you end up testing the underlying application the API connects to. Any complex processes, I'm looking for business logic. I'm looking, can I skip a step? Um, and lots of data, you know, information exposure, information disclosure, I'm looking for that kind of, um, you know, returning too much data. Is the, filter, is the client um, relying on um, us to do all the filtering here? So those are my interesting endpoints. And that kind of feeds into this cycle of we ch try and exploit. It doesn't work. We work out why it doesn't work, and then we change it. So when would this might be applicable? Well, let's go back to my example of a blind SQL payload. So I'll try and exploit for a blind SQL injection on, say, um, I don't know, um, MySQL, so specifically MySQL payload, it doesn't work. Now, does that not work because it's got filtering? Does that not work because it's actually using um, MS SQL? Does it not work because it's not even using SQL, it's using no SQL? So it's that working out why. Now, I don't always know why it doesn't work because it, I'm on the outside looking in. But what it allows me to do is kind of play around, you know, change it, try and understand what's happening. So when I find these kind of interesting endpoints, I'm really looking at kind of how to turn them from interesting to vulnerable. So what I'm really looking for is, you know, if I've got an Iodora bowler, I'm changing the ID. If I'm looking for, say, injection type things, I might try a simple XSS payload. I'm then asking, you know, does that work? You know, my simple test is like, okay, how can I write that a full exploit? Now, what I do is bug bounty hunting, so it's really important for me to show impact. So that means I need to show exactly how impactful a vulnerability I find actually is, because that's how I get paid. And then I'm asking myself, did it fail? You know, am I retesting it, or do I think it's filtered completely? So this cycle then changes to try the exploit. It doesn't work, but actually it does work. I'm creating the exploit. And that extra step of creating the exploit could be an entire webinar in itself because understanding impact and really presenting the most impactful scenario for a vulnerability is, you know, a hacker's dream. That's, that is what, why people get paid to hack things, right? So you might be listening to this and thinking, yeah, but what are you actually looking for? Like what? What on earth are you actually looking for? Like you said, you want to find interesting endpoints, but how do you know something's interesting? How do you know you need to look for that? Like, how do you know? That's a great question. I'd like to introduce the uh, OWASP API top 10. So OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, and it's basically um, a community-driven, gra grassroots 
um, security, uh, uh, like does everything from a uh, security organization, does everything from meetups to local chapters to webinars to all kinds of stuff. Um, and one of the things it produces is the OWASP's uh, security, uh, the OWASP top 10. And the OWASP top 10 is like when it was produced, the like most impactful top 10 vulnerabilities that web applications face. Um, so a few years ago, in 2019, because that was a few years ago now, and I know the pandemic has really shifted what timelines look like, um, a group, a community-led group called the OWASP API Security Project said, we want to make this, but for APIs, because actually the top 10, um, like the OWASP top 10, wasn't actually that applicable to APIs in quite a lot of cases. And some of the vulnerabilities that specifically was faced by APIs were actually removed in the most recent version of um, the OWASP top 10. So this kind of led this um, API security project, but also creating the API security top 10 2019. And so what is it? It's just a list of 10 vulnerabilities. If you're a developer, like these are the 10 vulnerabilities you need to know. Like you don't need to know anything in theory other than these 10, because that, those are the most important ones. So what do they look like? So each of them has like a number where it's like API one, API two, API three, the year. So as you know, the um, API security top 10 evolves, this number will be updated. And especially as we start to see threats change. So right now we're really starting to see, you know, uh, attacks against medical devices. We're really seeing more attacks against IoT security. We're seeing, you know, even automotive security. So we're starting to see less of what might be like the traditional API and more of these like embedded device APIs are with connected to like a mobile app um, that's actually sending the request. So as we see the landscape of how APIs are being used changes, the API security top 10 will change with it and evolve over time. So with that being said, um, in the 2019 edition, we have these 10 vulnerabilities. Um, broken object level authorization, so that's a BOLA. Broken user authentication. Um, we have excessive data exposure. Lack of resources and rate limiting. Broken function level authorization. Mass assignment. Security misconfiguration, injection, improper asset management, and insufficient logging and monitoring. And what you might notice is these are a lot of words. Um, it's written to be, you know, quite technical, but also quite snappy, which means it's difficult to actually represent the full scale of these vulnerabilities. It's really written in the language of the defenders. Now, for someone like me, who's a bug bounty hunter, this is actually still really, really good. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the language here to talk about less about defense and more about attack and how we actually find and test for these bugs in practice. So let's go through them. Um, every bug in the OWASP API top 10 explained for bug bounty hunters or attackers in general. So let's go through number one here. So this is broken object level authorization or a BOLA. These are also sometimes called IDORs. Um, but the term IDOR is super confusing because it actually covers like three of these, um, but don't worry about it. So APIs tend to expose endpoints that ha handle object identifiers. This means things like IDs, um, creating a wide attack surface uh, ac level access control issue, which means that you may not have the correct permissions to do what you're doing to specific objects. Object level authorization check should be considered in every function that accesses a data source using input from the user. So before um, we access a resource, we should be checking it just to make sure. Um, but what does this actually mean for an attacker? So it's a simple idle insecure direct object reference. The API isn't checking that you own a resource before you do something to it. Now it's really important, this is the API isn't checking that you own a resource, not a function. So the two different, like function and resource are two different ideas um, and they are two different um, issues in the API security top 10, um, but they're sometimes called idols uh, like together. So it's checking you don't, that you own a resource before you do something to it. 
So how do we know the, when we've kind of found one of these? What are the signs? So any ID, like numeric or UUID, is vulnerable to this, particularly in RESTful applications. And that's actually because RESTful, by default, should not have um, this concept of um, uh, uh, these, like the, the concept of ownership, so often it gets forgotten. Um, and so how do we actually find it? Well, what we will look for is we see an endpoint with an ID. What you should be doing is removing all of the cookies and seeing if it still works. And what this enables us to do is see, could somebody who's not logged in access that resource? The second thing to try and find it is if it doesn't, we can try replacing the cookies of one user with the cookies of another user, therefore demonstrating that you could log in be logged in as somebody else and then seeing if it works um or to put it another way what you could do is you could log in as one user get their i don't know um user id and replace it in a kind of uh, update user um api endpoint and put that on your other account and see if you can update another users so there's kind of two different ones. First is whether or not you can do something not logged in. And the second one, if you can do things cross user. Now, this gets confusing when you have lots of complex roles. And I'll, I'll go over this in more detail. Or you have the idea of tenancy. So what do we mean when we say tenancy? Well, we're talking about things where um, you have clients are from multiple um, uh companies who own multiple resources you might be able to if you're logged into company a any user in company a can access company a's resources if a user is actually from company b it shouldn't be able to and this is when you can start to get confused and this is also when you get the idea of like a bola and broken function level authorization um and you can be like, wow, they, they, they're very close. And that's why they used to be called idols. But moving on, API number two, API uh, two, broken user authentication. So when we talk about authorization, we're talking about what you can do. Authentication is who you are. So this is things like logging in. Authentication mechanisms are all often implemented incorrectly, allowing attackers to compromise authentication tokens or exploit implementation flaws to assume another user's identities temporarily or permanently. So what do we mean by that? We're meaning things where you have issues with sessions. Um, something like session fixation would be covered under this. We're also thinking of things like um, account takeovers. We're talking about the idea of being able to log in and perform actions as somebody else, as, as another user. Um, and what this like overall here, compromising the system's ability to identify the client or the user which compromises API security overall. If you don't know the person logged in truly is the person you think they are, your entire API can be exposed to these issues. Um, this is really common with things like OAuth implementations where actually to implement OAuth in, in like an API can be quite challenging. Um, so people often make mistakes. Um, it also occurs when you have things like API token, like API um, tokens where you are asking people to provide, um, you know, a token with their requests. Um, this can also occur when you're being like, when if you've got something like an account takeover. These are all, all be covered under that, this kind of general um, list. So what does it mean? The API should have some form of authentication, but it doesn't for whatever reason, or that an API can generate authentication for other users. So you can log in as somebody else. So we're talking about API keys. We're thinking about things like Google docking. Um, we're also looking and seeing what happens when we log in. So if we follow that login flow, is the API generating a token without really securing it. So is it just generating a token? You know, you type in a user ID, it returns back a token to log in as that user, or is it really implementing something like OAuth standards correctly? Um, we're looking at things like password reset here. So the first thing we do is we do Google dorking. So Google dorking 
is this idea of using Google um, to search for specific um, things like API keys. Uh, there are ways to use Google and GitHub searching to basically recall things like API keys. Um, you know, you look for inL API, you look for inL whatever, this key, maybe you look for something like GMAPS key, et cetera. Um, you can also look and see if you can find the internal APIs. So some internal APIs are not necessarily going to be as secure as ones that are supposed to be facing outwards to the internet. Um, however, that doesn't mean they always are not available. Quite often they're still available, but they're just, they've got some login functionality. Um, and it might actually be quite easy to break that login functionality. And my kind of advice is um, to always test login systems, especially, you know, password reset, anything generating tokens, Try and understand the flow of authentication. Um, so what do you need to authenticate? What APIs get uh, endpoints get hit? What order do they get hit in? Can you skip over some? Can you do X, Y, or Z? Um, Etc. So we next have excessive data exposure. Looking forward to generic implementations, developers tend to expose all object properties, so everything about an object, without considering their individual sensitivity. So if you have a piece of data, not all the, the, um, the parameters for that object might be okay to show. So if you're training, saying, for example, getting user information, you absolutely don't want to give someone the ability accidentally to view people's passwords or maybe email addresses, things like GDPR. And what this means is they basically rely on a client to filter the data. Um, uh, so you can kind of think about, you know, you have an app on your phone and they just send everything. And if you don't use it, you don't, you don't use it, right? Um, and you maybe only have like, you know, a single text box for someone's, I don't know, a username, but you might still be calling the API endpoint that returns all that information about a user. So that's that's that that vulnerability in a nutshell. So what does it mean? Um, it's also called information disclosure. An API is returning too much information. It doesn't need to. And that information can be a security risk. So a big example, is um, personal identifiable information, things like breaking GDPR accidentally, um, huge concern with this one. What are the signs for it? I am always looking at any um, endpoint that returns a lot of information. Um, I'm always looking at, you know, is that length of that response just huge in comparison to what I'm actually being shown on the, um, or on the app or on whatever I'm looking at. And it's not always going to be this type of bug because actually that that can be quite benign and quite innocent. But it's always worth investigating. So how can you find it? So API enumeration, press buttons, find API endpoints you wouldn't normally be looking at. Or alternatively, look and see what something like a mobile app is actually doing under the hood, like it's quite difficult to get set up with mobile app testing. But if you do, you can find some really juicy bugs. If you see a lot of information being returned, you've got to ask yourself, is that a risk? Would I be okay if that was my data? And especially one thing I'd really recommend doing is becoming familiar with legislation like GDPR, because GDPR may not apply to you because you may be based in the US. Um, but actually, if you want to get into things like hacking, GDPR is very quickly becoming a big issue because the rules about GDPR apply to any company if they're storing information of somebody who's based in the European Union. So you don't actually have to like um, be in, in the EU yourself for this to actually count. You can be in the US and if your customers are in the, are in the UK, they're in France, they're in Belgium, then GDPR applies to them. So it's really important to kind of learn 
what GDPR considers, you know, personal identifiable information, because you might actually be surprised by what it counts as um, PII to something like GPR versus to something like um, the California Data Protection Act, which is coming in very soon. So API 4, lack of resources and late rate limiting. I've got the wrong um, a description here. But essentially what this means is that you have got a um, an API which is vulnerable to something like rate limiting. Maybe it sends you know, emails and you hit that 30,000 times. So it sends out dutifully 30,000 emails and you can use that as kind of like to harass somebody or just to be really annoying. On the kind of more extreme end, you have things like, um, you know, if you're using like AWS where you're paying for resources, if you don't have rate limiting on, you can end up, it can end up costing you a lot of money if you're vulnerable to something like this. It also can be really annoying. So this would cover things like DOS attacks um, and DDoS attacks where if you don't have the right, um, amount of resources to cover those, even if it's actually not a kind of formal attack, but it's actually just a, um, like just having too many users come on your API at once. Maybe you, you know, go viral and people really want to check out your app. Um, you can be vulnerable to this where your app just stops working for everyone. It's a terrible first impression. So what does it mean? It means you can perform things like a denial of service, an API because it doesn't limit the amount of requests you can do. More interestingly, I've seen this used to brute force information from an API. So you can imagine a login functionality where you can brute force um, things like logging into someone's account by just trying every password. But it also means you can do things like find API um, endpoints really, really quickly or being able to do things um, that are way more complex, like response splitting and all of that jazz um, and beyond the scope. So what are the signs of this bug? You honestly can't tell from the outside. It's difficult to spot. So just be aware that this can be an issue. And the best way to test it is to um, try it and see if it, if it has um, lack of rate limiting on it. Um, the problem is that you can find with this is actually that most people don't consider it a security vulnerability unless you can use it in another attack and kind of add something onto it. For example, um, if an API requests an ID, you can brute force um, just testing it until it works. Um, you can maybe test things like uh, logging into like, people's accounts. You can test things like a bunch, like a bunch of stuff. You can test for, you know, all of these and not just limit it to uh, like email sending, for example. Right, API five broken function level authorization, complex access control policies. So that's different roles with different hierarchies, groups, and roles have an, an unclear separation between administrative and regular functions. So if you have a lot of roles that have like different requirements and that have, you know, different permissions, um, unless it's really clear, it can be, uh, you can end up doing stuff you shouldn't be able to and accidentally causing a privilege escalation, tend to lead to authorization flaws. By exploiting these issues, attackers gain access to other users' resources and or administrative functions. So what does it mean? Um, it's a permission type IDOR. You're able to do an admin action even though you're a regular user. That's quite a simple way of explaining things, but nowadays where we have applications with tenancy, we have multiple roles within a single tenant, when we actually care about security and we're trying to make sure you know we're following um, security procedures like least amount of privileges, um, we're able to access different applications within something like it's very easy to mess one of these up and to accidentally allow somebody to um, cause a privilege escalation by doing it in action so what are the signs of this bug honestly they happen in any complex permission hierarchy especially enterprise software 
enterprise software is literally a minefield of these vulnerabilities because it probably hasn't been updated in a while. It probably had these bugs to do in like introduced when it was made. And the complex relationship of all these different permissions can mean it's really difficult <laughs> to actually work out what somebody should have access to what and what they don't have access to. And also, if you're looking at IDs, IDs are always a great time to look for either bowlers or frozen function level authorizations. How can you find it? I recommend using containers in Firefox. I've actually got an entire video on my YouTube channel that's going into how to use these, um, but essentially it allows you to log into two accounts at the same time and send all of those to something like Burp or to OWASP Zap. Um, and when you do log in, one is a admin and one is a regular user on the admin. Just try and do admin application, like admin things, change somebody, invite somebody to something, um, change you know someone's username, change someone's password, do something else. Um, and then just swap the cookies for the regular user. So you're doing that as if you were the regular user. And there's a great um, tool. And if you're not really comfortable with this, there's a tool called Autorize, which is a BERT plugin which does this all automatically for you. So it's a huge help for um, being able to test these. API 6 is mass assignment. Binding client provided data, e.g. JSON, so that's where we give them data to data models. That means they're going straight to the database without proper properties filtering based on a whitelist. So that means that we give it a bunch of data and it doesn't check that we're actually allowed to edit that data or create that data usually leads to mass assignment either guessing object properties or exploring other a api endpoints reading the documentation providing additional object properties and request payloads allow attackers to modify object properties they're not supposed to this is again very similar to broken object level authorization and often is considered the same vulnerability and is often called an idol but it essentially means that I have an endpoint that's like um, uh, put user. So we're going to be changing the user in some way. We're going to be updating it. The actual endpoint should only be able to have me update my username, email address, um, and my first name. But actually, it allows us to also update our password. It allows us to update um, our user ID so we can change our user ID. It's things like that. So. A really, it's that an API will accept additional parameters unintentionally and change them alongside the intentional ones. So you shouldn't be able to update things like IDs, for example. So yeah, imagine a, a API endpoint that changes your username and you gave it the right parameters. It would change other properties, for example, your password, your user ID, that you're just not supposed to. Any time an API is built on a framework, these can be really, really common. And that's by default, these are often not implemented correctly. Um, if you ever see, you know, if you ever do an API te uh, like test and it comes back and it sends you a bunch of different um, uh, like results, you can sometimes take that JSON and put it back in and see whether or not you can test it. Um, often these are found by like pure recon though. Like this often requires the use of tools um to actually see if you know you've got additional parameters and to actually find them um eg for a user you know if you change the username you should also te test for likely ones email password user id like the actual other things you'd expect the user to have api 7 is security misconfiguration security misconfiguration is commonly a result of unsecured default con configurations incomplete or ad hoc configurations, open cloud storage, misconfigured HTTP headers, unnecessary HTTP methods, permissive um, cores, or verbose error messages containing sensitive information. Like, what does this mean? This means whoever is managing the API made some mistakes when configuring the server, e.g. by not updating it, e.g. by not switching some things off. There are so many different bugs included on this. I can't even give you the sign of these bugs because they, they're so they're so broad. Really common in smaller teams, though. Like you could take the um, ones here. So the um, default configurations on something like 
um, Google Cloud Platform. You could test for unnecessary HTTP methods. So testing, you know, get, put, delete, um, post, misconfigured headers. Like this is just something you can test and go down the list. Really, the how can I find it is to learn common misconfiguration bugs. One really great way to learn these is to actually try deploying something yourself uh, because you'll very quickly realize how bad and how easy it is to actually make these mistakes. Um, for example, cause CSRF, a really nice attack. Um, API 8 injection. Injection flaws such as SQL injection, no SQL, command injection, occur when untrusted data is sent to an interpreter as part of a command or query. The attacker's malicious data can trick the interpreter into executing unintended commands or access data without proper authorization. So the idea here is that our um, API is accepting data it shouldn't, and that's doing something on the back end there. Um, so it's just not being sanitized. So SQL injection is a big one. So SQL injection is probably one of the worst bugs next to remote code execution that an application can face, especially an API. Um, so really, it's worth uh, checking this one, one of the first ones I'd recommend checking. Um, this is really common on internal or not for public use APIs where bugs may have been left in or older applications where they've forgotten about. You can also pivot on an older application to something newer with something like an SQL injection because the data may also be shared. Um, how can you find it? Well, there's this great repo called Payload All The Things, which basically has a whole list of payloads for no SQL injection, for SQL injection, for command injection, for template injection, for SQ, uh, XSS, tons of them. And you can just try all of these. Um, and it's a great way to get started. If you notice some filtering, you can adjust your approach. API 9, improper assets management. APIs tend to expose more endpoints than traditional web applications, making proper and updated documentation highly important. Proper hosts and deployed API version inventory also play a big role to mitigate issues such as deprecated API versions and exposed debug endpoints. What does it mean? Even though we fixed all of the bugs in API 1 and there's no security flaws in API 2, it's still up and it's still connected to the same data source. So it's still vulnerable even if you fixed it in the latest version because you didn't um, check that it wasn't it, it was still up. Anywhere you see versioning, you should be looking for this. You should also be looking at whenever um, you can find things like specific um, uh, API uh, resource names, for example. It's very difficult to tell, and as we'll see in a second, what you actually control with an API, because very quickly, it kind of explodes in complexity. Um, and so this tends to be where we actually find quite a lot of bugs is where, you know, somebody said, we need to do this. And they're like, OK, I'll do that. And they're like, we need to do this as well. And we do that. And before you notice, you've got like three different API endpoints that all do roughly the same thing. Um, these often rely on a little bit of recon to find. But to be honest, by the time you've gotten here, you'll probably have noticed like one of the other bugs. Um, and you'll already have like a big list of endpoints that's worth looking into. Um, one thing you should really look for in this is actually pivoting to other um, bugs because sometimes stuff will be fixed. It won't be removed for sake of deprecation um, and so just people don't have to update and it's still vulnerable and you haven't actually resolved the bug. You just like create a new version that doesn't have the bug. So really, really important to um, look at that stuff and sort of stuff. We're on the final one now, API 10, insufficient logging and monitoring. Insufficient logging and monitoring coupled with missing or ineffective integration with incident response. So there's no logging and also it's not connected to our incident response, allows attackers to further attack systems, um, maintain persistence, pivot to more systems, extract or destroy data. Most breach studies demonstrate the time to detect a breach is over 200 days. Typically, detect 
detected by external parties rather than internal pro processes and monitoring. And what does that mean? This is really for the defending team. Um, it means they don't know what parts of their API are being exploited and how. You know, even if they actually have logs, it's very difficult for them to use those logs and actually explore that data and actually understand it. Um, and this is where we brought to this, this webinar is brought to you by Traceable AI, who does this for you. Um, it's not really much of a bug on something like the bug bounty side. But it's something to really keep in mind um, if you're especially designing APIs is that you need a way to actually understand, not just, you know, logging things, understand those logs and actually turn that into actionable intelligence. So how does this actually apply to something like looking for bowlers or idols? Um, so if I could just take kind of like a step back uh, to very first, first one, how do we actually do this? Um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to test every endpoint. Now, often this means looking at every resource, sorting that by all the CRUD functionality and going, you know, user A should be able to create that resource, update that resource, delete the, up the resource um, and read the resource. But user B should be able to just read the resource. So what that means is that if we've got a tick in any of these boxes that should be crosses, um, that they're vulnerable. And it really does mean test every endpoint. For something like um, bowlers, you've got to go in one by one to really um, to really find them. But what does this look in practice? So I was looking at testing this application, not Tube. Um, and you can kind of think about it like YouTube. It's not actually YouTube, nor is it one of YouTube's competitors. It's just It's a story. I can't tell much about it. So we've got a, a NotTube, and this is the admin interface for NotTube. You have some information about the video, you have the title, you have the description. You know, you don't have permission to edit it. And no one apart from the video's owners should be able to edit any of these fields. You can't edit the title, you can't edit the description, you can't edit the thumbnail. You can access it. But what you could do is you could see it. And in the case of a private video, if we go back, way back to the slide over here, you know, user A should be able to create, read, update, delete. User B should be able to read these in very specific circumstances. But if something's private, we can put a cross in the read functionality, right? So we can say you shouldn't be able to read that. That's a private video. And what I basically found on this not tube is that, no, I couldn't edit anything. So, you know, I tested for creating resources on behalf of another user. I tested for um, updating resources. I tested for deleting resources. But I actually could read them even when something was supposed to be public. I could read all of this information. So that is kind of the classic um, bowler is being able to kind of access one of these CRUD functionalities. And with that, I will leave you with the end slide. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening to me. Uh, we have some time for questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Katie. Lots of great information there. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, for hanging out and, and uh, listening to the uh, presentation. Uh, we hope that this detail will help security leaders and developers to better understand the risks that APIs can pose and better test their own APIs for these vulnerabilities. Um, so, as Katie mentioned, yeah, we do have some questions in the pipe, uh, so we'll get going on those. Uh, first question is, what is the most critical issue of all these you've showed us that we should be focusing on? It depends. Different answer depending on what side you're on. Sounds like you're on the blue team, the defenders. The most important thing is that insufficient logging and monitoring. It is by far the most boring of them. Like, it's not an interesting hacker thing. But having good instant response, like making sure you're the first people to know about a, vul a vulnerability before it hits like um, a new site, knowing that you know you can react to an incident occurring and actually you know um, make changes um, really is so vital. If you don't have the right logging, and even if you're logging things, but you can't actually use that data that can be really critical because it means you have no information. And not only do you have no information, you have no way of acting on the information you do have. Um, so that's one of the most difficult ones 
and also probably the most critical one to remedy. Now, if you're a um, bug hunter, if you want to see critical vulnerabilities, um, definitely injection. Injection is like a classic vulnerability, SQL injection, code injection, command injection. It's kind of typical. It's kind of, you know, we love to see it. We love to see those types of vulnerabilities because when um, they're vulnerable, that's critical vulnerability. It exposes so much of um, your data. It exposes so much that that's the first technical one that most people, I think, um, will look for. Great. Thanks for that uh, thorough answer. Um, someone said, uh, I'm excited to, to check out these things. Um, you know, see them live, work with them in action. How do I avoid getting in trouble? I think actually you mentioned a little bit about that. We get to hear that again as a reminder. Yeah, it's really important that when we talk about this, hacking is fun. It is fun. We don't touch things we don't own. And if we are touching things we don't own, we have permission to. And I can't stress that enough. No one should come from this webinar and be like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to try this on, you know, when I'm next, like reading social media. You shouldn't touch something you don't have express permission, either from yourself because you own it or through something like a bug bounty program and penetration test. Something like that where you have got the permission of the people that do own the assets to actually conduct this. Don't test random websites. Um, nobody really appreciates it if you are going to get into security research the first thing you need to do is make sure you have enough money to hire a lawyer because people won't necessarily always take good faith or what we might see as, as good good faith security um uh, security advice very well because it is against the law in most countries such as the uk with the computer misuse act and the us with the computer fraud and abuse act Yeah, definitely want to be conscious and careful with all of that, right? Uh, so what's the most challenging exploit to, I think it's catch uh, and why? Yeah, so all of them end up being pretty challenging. One thing that really sets API hacking apart from other types of hacking is that with APIs, we're often this weird mix between being quite functional, which is that um, we're often dealing with like business um, logic. We're dealing with that kind of functional task that a, a, a business will need to do. But we're also really close to code. And it can be really difficult to kind of get something actually working. Um, injection, while also being quite a, a, a severe vulnerability, can actually be quite difficult because quite a lot of um, uh, like frameworks will, by default, do some amount of filtering there. Mass assignment is also quite challenging, not because of filtering, but because you need to know a lot about that function level. Um, and something like um, security misconfiguration means you have to know a lot about the code. So it ends up being this quite interesting mix of like some that require quite a lot on the code side, some that require quite a lot of information about how the API works, and some which are just hard because they're usually remedied um, already in quite a lot of, uh, uh, like frameworks. Thanks for that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so someone's asking for an example of excessive data exposure that you've seen in the wild. So I can't go into depth about this, but I was testing a web application and this wasn't used by people inside the EU because a GDPR didn't really apply. But what did happen was you could just give it some information about a person and it would return a ton of information back. Now, some of this, you know, was perhaps kind of normal, um, like their last name. And some of it, you could just get data from LinkedIn to find out the place they worked and guess their email and their first name, and it would basically log you onto their account. And you could see everything about them, but not just about them, because you could log into their account. You could see tons of information in the API um, that was kind of being called. Now, this is kind of somewhat of about authentication, but the API got so much information about these people that just wasn't on the wasn't on anything 
Um, and with that information, what you could do is you could generate money. <laughs> Um, so you could log in as somebody else, generate tons of money on their account, and then you could log out, leaving them to clean up the mess after you've kind of defrauded this company while well, you took out all the money. So that's a kind of fun example of how, I guess, how a lot of API bugs end up coming together in a vulnerable application to have, like, real-world impact. Yikes. That is a scary story. Amazing, though. Um Wow, thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, with that, uh, we're at the end of the questions. Uh, so uh, this concludes this webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll join us again for the next in the series on July 6th, where Katie will be covering mobile API testing. Uh, once again, thank you for your time and attention. Have a good rest of your day or evening. Thank you, everybody.